Hey, and thanks for being a part of another episode of Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. I've told you about it before, but now is as good a time as any to be a part of Stitcher.com slash NotSam and the premium version of Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. If you subscribe through Stitcher.com slash NotSam, not only will you get this show ad-free, but you will get our exclusive captive audience bonus show Every other week where I sit down with people in my life, whether it's my wife, whether it's my dad, whether it's a coworker, and try to introduce them to a different wrestling show each episode. This week, brand new show, went up on Monday. It's the first episode of Monday Night Raw. My wife Jess and I sit down, and I show her what Monday Night Raw looked like in 1993. I try to put everything into context for her. I try to explain everything to a novice, but you can watch along. You turn it on on the network, you turn on our podcast, and you get a brand new experience. It's Captive Audience, available only at stitcher.com slash notsam. Now, let's get this podcast started, huh? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. Introducing your host from New York, here is Sam Roberts. Welcome, 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 welcome back on the East Coast. It's Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Every week is a big week. That's why I start almost every show with, hey, we got a big week this week. They're all big weeks. When you only do a show once a week, they better all be big weeks, and we got a big one for you. So, as I said, back on the East Coast, thanks again to Skylar Aston for opening up his home to us. I'm back at home, though, inside the wonderful and gorgeous Not Sam Studios. Uh, and this week... Uh, I have an interview that I was hoping to get. I didn't know if I would get, but I figured if I'm going to get him on the podcast at any point, now is going to be the time. This week's guest is Mauro Ranallo. So Mauro's got this amazing documentary coming out on Showtime. It's called Bipolar Rock and Roller. And, you know, us wrestling fans have, for the last several months, pretty much since he mysteriously left WWE for a little bit, have become aware of the fact that this guy was suffering from bipolar disorder, but we didn't really know what that looked like. This documentary shows you what that looks like. I mean, I have never, in all the wrestling documentaries and all the documentary documentaries that I've ever watched, I don't remember somebody being this open and honest with what they're going through. I mean, the fact that he produced this himself, not a third party, uh, it's unbelievable. There's, they've been filming since 2013. You see him in all his highs. You see him in all his very, very lows. You see some of the, uh, what goes on in his brain that allows him to be that Morrow that we all see being this animated commentator. And it gives you a little bit more insight to maybe what he was going through when he left WWE. Of course, we broached that topic in the interview, as well as a whole bunch of other stuff. Now, we concentrate mainly uh, on the mental health aspects of this movie and his story because I think that they're really, really valuable. But, of course, I snuck in some wrestling questions. Jim Norton joins me on this interview as Morrow's time in New York was limited. He had time to come in. He did one interview at Sirius XM, and it was for my show, Jim Norton and Sam Roberts, which is on every morning, uh, Monday through Friday, starting at 8 a.m. Eastern over on Sirius XM 103. But I knew that you guys would want this insight, would want to hear from the guy, would want to hear from Morrow. So I said, Jim, why don't we dual purpose this thing? Why don't we have a Jim Norton appearance on Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast at the same time that we have a Morrow Ronaldo appearance on Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast? No reason to be stingy with this interview. No reason to leave it just to the Sirius XM folks. I now share it with you this week on Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. Mamma mia! It's the one and the only Mauro Ranallo. And now, the Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast interview. 
Mauro Ranallo, how are you? Speaking of talking too fast, hello everyone. <laughs> now, Mauro, you're some kind of broadcaster, is that? Um, <laughs> I, I've been known to say a few words over the years, maybe more than most people would have liked to have heard. But one of the first times I became aware of you was a uh, Mirko Krokop uh, video. Where what, did, what exactly did they do? Where he he kind of punked you? Yeah, he did punk me. Uh, that was set up by the illustrious, legendary El Wapo Boss Rutin, who you may know as Rooker from. Uh, the CBS sitcom Kevin Can Wait that should have been renewed for a third season so my man could get paid, but that didn't happen. <laughs> uh, he's a, a, a fighter of, of you know, no, to one of the baddest men on the planet. And uh, when I started working in Japan, he helped get me the gig. And Mirko Krokop, even now, even though he's out of Bellator 200, which I'm doing on Friday, was looking forward to his Bellator debut. Uh, known for being a very stoic, silent killer type, and it was my first time meeting him, and I let Boss know that I'm nervous of the guy. I will interview him, but I'd rather you do it so I can get my feet wet. And he's like, no, no problem. So he ends up interviewing his opponent, the guy that I was supposed to interview, and I go and interview uh, Mirko, and you see on the video what transpired. And that was my uh, third show with the uh, the company. I thought, okay, well, this this chapter in my life is over, and perhaps my life is over because when you see him walk towards me at the end, I'm thinking uh, Kaiser Sose and Usual Suspects, and where he's walking over me, and then boom, big head kick right to my <laughs> face. Uh, instead, he goes, it's a joke. So it, it's lived on for 14 years, believe it or not. Yeah, I still you did get look a lot of really, feedback. really frightened. No, you I was. legitimately frightened. Yeah. yeah. Like you I, didn't see it coming. No, and uh, there was a beeline to the hotel room to, you know, I, I'm glad I was wearing dark pants. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> yeah. A change needed to happen. <laughs> um, when, you're, when you're doing all this stuff, because the documentary uh, that is coming out on Showtime uh, on Friday at 9 p.m. Bipolar Rock and Roller. Which is, it's a, it's amazing... Like, I kind of knew your story, but mm -hmm. the, the level to which you revealed in this thing is, like, off the charts. Like, it's as revealing as anybody, especially in your position, mm -hmm. right? Because you're in this position of you, you're you suffering from bipolar, but at the same time, you're as successful in broadcasting as you've ever been. Yes. You could easily use this moment to kind of push that aside a little bit, let the good times roll, mm -hmm. and, like, let me be there for my spots, and if I'm going crazy over here in a hotel room, don't <laughs> worry about it. Don't look at me. Sure. Like, I'll see you at the next show, but instead, like, you kind of let us all see, not, you know, it's not just a description of, like, what mania looks like, mm -hmm. what a manic episode looks like, like, what, what, if I'm this high right now, what do the lows look like? Like, you see and that was These the lows. entire you point. See Sam. the emotion. Yes, you, see, you like you're just pouring. Yep, and out. It's, and and Jim, uh, you know, not to you're I'm a successful comedian. You you're a successful broadcaster. What I'm saying, I believe the most successful people in this industry are touched by something. Like Robin Williams said, "Touched by man is touched by fire." For me, it has been a constant struggle of trying to just. Uh, for me, work is therapy. And because of what you see, uh, back up, the, the documentary had to be as revealing, as raw, as uncomfortable to watch, or else there would be no point to it. Hey, I, yeah, we all have a unique journey. We all had a dream as kids. Uh, our, you know, Some of our dreams came true, but the point of this doc was we write about it, we talk about it sometimes, but no one, like you say, has made it uh, as clear as we tried to do in this doc what mental illness looks like and it's the invisible illness we're not in a wheelchair i'm not on crutches uh you know people have this it's all about the stigma snap out of it you're you're oh you're yeah. just lazy or oh you're just looking for attention well here you go this is this is what it looks like am i looking for attention or am i am i suffering human being at times it, right and that's where i'm i want to just make it okay to not be okay it's not just looking for attention because there's times where like you know i deal with my own nonsense sure. we all do but when you're dealing with it alone, hmm. like you're by yourself, right? And you're thinking like life is good. I got to jump off the balcony. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's crazy and, thinking. And Jim, alone in a crowd, I can be, and this is it. Like this, Linus had his blanket, these head, these headphones, this microphone. Even though it's an antithetical to what most people would say, because public speaking after death, the thing people are afraid of, or or being on camera, this is my security blanket. And so for me, even the moment I take it off. And, and, you know, people milling about backstage or, or people coming up, hey, man, big fan. I'm immediately, oh, my God, oh, my God. And, and 
there's this sense of jubilation because, wow, you get to call the biggest fights. And you know, look at TakeOver New Orleans, man. One of the yeah. greatest events ever. Yeah. I should have been riding that high forever. Instead, not even moments later, I'm like, oh, God, I'm a fraud. Oh, shit, they're going to they're gonna fire me or See, all me people. Me, yeah. Yeah, it's unbelievable. And Which is especially, that's why. It's especially unbelievable because you go over like all the, all the shots that you've gotten and the fact that even like you talk about TakeOver in WWE. The last year has been ridiculous, my man. Klitschko and Joshua yeah. in front of 90,000 of Wembley. Mayweather, McGregor. Yeah. Second biggest pay per view ever. I, AJ Styles, John Cena, 2017 I mean, match of the year. They all be, so without the condition, without the illness, the career <laughs> from literally growing up on a dead end road in a farm in, in you know BF nowhere to to doing all of this, it it's bipolar in its own sense. Mm-hmm. And even now, I, I sense. Look at me getting more excited, more <laughs> rapid, more. I. It just happens, isn't it? A, it's like, a, and I've, I've described it before. I don't know how to say. It. It's like a chemical dump. Yes, like it, yes. it, it starts at the top <laughs> yes. of your head, and you feel it like wash into your upper chest, and it's a, it can be comforting or it can be very painful. Very well said, Jim. But it's something that is you can't describe what it is. But whether it's a sexual rush or yep. it's a rush of depression, and then all of a sudden it becomes elation. Like it's just, it, it, it's almost like it, it's just it, it's a warmth. It's menthol. Do I, you I, have a camera in my? Did you? surreptitiously put a camera in my life and been watching because you're describing it to a T. Well, if you have a toilet, I put a camera there. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, you, you, well, how well said is that? And you just said it's hard to describe. And for us who talk for a living and mm-hmm. do it quite well, I would imagine, that's why it had to be visceral. It had to be visual. I remember uh, Ron Howard, A Beautiful Mind, Russell Crowe, and how he depicted schizophrenia. And I thought for the first time in my life, dealing with what I'm dealing, man, this guy, he, he gets the... The poetic, the creative nature of all this, because let's face it, and they're bipolar in definition. The I don't think I'd be here sitting with you guys if I wasn't the manic part of it. I believe that that has really proved to be the jet fuel that has let me reach all of these heights of success. So, what, oh, sorry. There, no, sorry. There is there is a positive to the negative. That's what I was about. I was literally just about to ask. When when do you look at yourself and go, I'm I'm kind of glad I'm this way because it fuels me creatively, or do you ever go like, I just wish I was like? Do you ever look at people who are in a happy relationship and are just content? Like, oh, we had a great time. We watched a movie, went to bed, and you're like, I wish I was that person. Like, I would love to know what that's like to be that person. Great question. Absolutely not, because most relationships I've been subjected to are just not happy, even though they say they are. And that's the other people always ask, well, how, how do you deal with personal relationships? Uh, last time I had a serious relationship was 15 years ago. Again, a Jenny Neidhart, Natty's sister, yeah. Jim Neidhart's uh, daughter. She's in the movie. The, the, yeah, she, yeah. And, and that the, I've always been drawn to people who either get me totally or just want to ride the wave of, of mania. And, and as you see, even in the doc, but we used to have get togethers at my friend's place. I was a nightclub DJ as well. And it's, you know, we go four hours of spinning and then we go until five, six in the morning at, at their place, just improvising, doing our own version of SNL or whatever. But looking back now, sure. If for a first glance, that's entertaining, but holy shit, there's some, <laughs> what's up with, and I wasn't on anything. I wasn't on cocaine. Or I was drinking. The only self-medication I did before really trying to find right treatment was I was drunk 42 days in a row and it wasn't a, a good thing, but, and as has been broached, uh, the only thing I have found to, to keep me, you know, hanging on, as Kim Wilde would say, uh, cannabis. And I don't know if it's the, what it is in THC that, that with my chemicals or my makeup, and this is what's so frustrating, guys, as much as uh, I'm trying to, to bang the drama, we have Mariah Carey and Kevin Love, DeMar DeRozan, Logic, and all of these actors, Jim Norton is doing his thing here today as well. We, we need to, to raise voices, but we still don't know what it is. Is it a chemical imbalance? Is it hereditary? Is it a, a product of our environment? I know that it's multi-generational on my mom's side, especially when it comes to depression. But in terms of treatment, we need more money, not less. Look what's happening to our military veterans. The amount of feedback, you guys, just based on the trailer that I've received, predominantly by men, and how open they are in sharing with me their fears, their struggles. I had an 18-year-old girl from Germany text me this morning, or text me, email me this morning, literally saying, and and it, you know, I can break down or whatever, saying that just seeing the trailer has inspired her to get help. She was going to kill herself. So for me, it's not about being messianic or the, I'm Jesus. I want to help save lives that are being 
they're dying unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. well, how does it make you feel? Like that? That's an amazing impact because you do sports for a living. You sure. do this great announcing, and then you reveal something personal, and you actually realize that people are like changed by it. This is the. This is why I'm on this earth, honestly, Jim. I've always wanted to perform. I wanted, buddy. You have no idea how much respect I have for stand-up comedians because to me, that's always been something. Wow, I'd love to just try and see. And then the 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 crippling, debilitating fear of bombing is the. You know, it's just so. For me, it's this, I want to be an advocate. I want, I've always looked out for the little guy. I can remember being eight, nine years old at school. We'd have hot dog days and 75 cents. You get your little chocolate milk and your hot dog. And there was a boy there but twice in a row. He, he didn't participate. And this is in the seventies. And I'm like, I, I went and robbed change out of my dad's pockets. So this kid could have. Part of hot dog day, and I'm not. Oh, what a great guy! But that's who I am. That's how I'm. You're wired. A thief. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Robin Hood, baby. Uh, but seriously, it's. I've always loved the underdog. We all do, but I and I know that in many ways I am. So I wanted to show people. Look what I'm doing. It's a constant struggle, but talking about it like you guys are allowing me to do, and having just your support network, Sam, Jim. You're now my support network. I have so many people who are, are wanting good things for me, I want others to feel that because people are suffering in silence and it's costing them their lives. When you go and you showed, it, it kind of surprised me in the documentary that you you talk about the cannabis and how yes. that's what I, I'm you surprised you they show. allowed it. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, whether it's because more and more nowadays I hear from individuals who have various different ailments that cannabis mm. is what helps them, but... I don't hear that from organizations. Have sure. you had any blowback, whether it's from Showtime or WWE or Bellator or any of these, any, any organization? It warms the cockles of my heart that I have had nothing but unmitigated support. And I know why. Uh, it starts with Steven Espinosa and Showtime because uh, uh, Harris Usanovich, my best friend, who was the guy I let in and let, you know, film all of this wouldn't happen without him by the way he deserves he he spent his own money uh was away from his young family for days this was a labor of love for him because he firmly believed in the message that we were going to try to get across but wwe uh bellator but like i say steven espinoza at first said man you know we got to protect him like this is our guy he's our voice of showtime boxing and as soon as he said it he said to himself well this is that's the problem right there yeah we have to show so and yes, we are, uh, from what I hear, billions of dollars a year lost to mental health issues, uh, people, you know, not being able to work. And yet, if you have the flu, if you're undergoing chemotherapy treatment, uh, undergoing dialysis, with all due respect, to, and I, I've lost people to, to every known illness known, how can you not then allow people who are unable to get out of bed because they're looking at the light fixture, wondering if it can hold their weight? We, we, without mental health, there is no health. I wish people, it's, it's all a, just about the stigma, stigma of mental health, stigma of cannabis, stigma of sports entertainment, professional wrestling, call it what sure. you will. It's, I just want to get the conversation started. I don't care how vulnerable I am made to feel. If it can save one life and judging by the feedback already, it's doing that. How the hell can anyone give me backlash? Are you sexually compulsive or no? Yes, sir. Wow. Yeah. Great question. First time ever asked. Um, yes, sir. I, I, <laughs> Wow, good. This is really, and you know, Ariel Hawani's show yesterday. Yeah. I, I I went out and I know Jim because these are the kinds of shows I really wanted to do because it's not just about fight talk or this thing. That stuff needs to be addressed. I have had, I used to phone nine hundred numbers and just put the phone down, racking up the bill, not even listening because it was my way of sabotaging my parents. My they go, what the hell, nine hundred dollar phone bill? What the fuck is wrong with you? And I'm like, yeah, there is something wrong with me. Um, but. When I was a nightclub DJ, it, it was not good. And it was all, it was never enjoyable. It was just about um, trying to medicate. And yeah. there is that. It's, and so even now, I, I am single, but I, I feel I can't be in a marriage or a relationship or bring a child into the world because at my lowest points, I would not wish what I go through under any, uh, towards anyone. So, um it's weird, man. I, I it, that that's also something I think uh, that has to be investigated because everything's impulsive. I spend money. I spent uh, over fifteen hundred dollars buying people dinner over the last two three days. Just yeah. I'm always that guy. I, I I love to take care of everybody, regardless of the cost. So uh, thankfully, Frank Shamrock, who the legendary fighter course, who sure. has become my best friend and manager, he uh, takes care of my finances and helps me uh, with my life. And I wouldn't be where I am without people like him. So. I have people looking after me. 
Otherwise, it would be it would be big trouble. Yeah, and it's it's the, the nine hundred numbers. It's funny. I remember years ago the way to do it was you had to send in a money order. I didn't have credit cards. <laughs> I sent in a money order to California, and I got sent back a, a list of phone numbers wow. you can call between these hours. And I wanted to jerk off at some crazy hour. And I remember the girl on the phone went, what? You want to talk like that at this hour? <laughs> she got so mad See, at me. <laughs> then the, one time, the one time I called where I really wanted to talk to someone, yeah. she went, hello. Uh, and I said, hey, how, how's it going? Uh, this is, you know, Mark, I think was my n- nom de sure. guerre. Mark. She goes, not tonight, honey. I got an earache. Oh, I'm no. I'm like, you son of a what? bitch. <laughs> What? Has te- has texting- Not tonight. I got a headache. Not tonight. I have an earache. Sorry. Has texting gotten you? And then the phone. Because you got it right here all the time. Yeah. You can't put it down. Yeah. I. Uh, I'm. I'm a phone addict for sure. People. Well, here I'll tell you guys that it was always made fun of. I. I was late to the Twitter party. I came in 2009. And guys, I have 222.1 thousand tweets that oh I've made. Oh my gosh! Well, Think you're also that. like you're a you're I'm very a, interactive, and you're a retweeting professional. Well, well, I I'm the mayor of Retweet City, as you know, and and it's part of my way of trolling other people <laughs> on the. Hey, you guys wanted to create this wonderful thing? Well, here you go. I'll, I'll send you an avalanche of shit. But uh, but look, 222 thousand tweets. So, every, yeah, I'm very much a. Uh, High, you, highly addictive personality. Are you a numbers guy too? Like, do you keep up with stuff like that? Like, oh, 220, okay, I gotta go yeah, to 230 well, and I gotta. What's this say on my bracelet? 11 uh, 11. And that's been uh, another, again, whether a sign, whether whatever it is. Uh, you, you you know, there was a show that was on HBO that was canceled already, Here and Now, that actually had the 11 11 phenomenon as one of its storylines. And I'm like, I'm, it, it's been something that's followed me around throughout my life. And I've always thought. Well, it has to be something. I look, go online, you see everyone's conspiracy theories. For the most part, is it a, it's a positive thing. But I, I am, yeah, quirky in that way. And, and, and just, you know, the memory of names and stats and, and what. That's why I, uh, the condition has really helped my career. But the personal toll has been severe. What do so, you like? Sorry, Sam. What no, do you like ahead. when you argue? Do you get, I, 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 I tell louder. you, get vicious and I, I told you, you're Absolutely, arguing with the Jim. movie screen. You forget that there's yeah. a real person. Attached. I get super loud, and I get I go to the jugular. I have a like yourself. I got a very good vocabulary, but I at at my at my angriest, the the vocabulary's gone, and it is it is very hurtful. And that's the other thing. Like I've you know threatened my family's life when I was very sick. I've obviously threatened my own, but I and it's. I go from being the sweetest human being. I'll never forget when I was at a, a nightclub DJ. I was va- uh, dating the bartender, and I was so looking forward to seeing her beautiful girl. Hey, honey, uh, this. I come in. I say, hey, honey, how's it going? I go into the DJ booth, put the records down. She comes up, starts massaging me. What the fuck are you doing? We've got more with the bipolar rock and roller. But before we get there, if you want to be a part of rock and roll shows, if you want to be a part of wrestling shows, sporting events, comedy shows, Broadway You need tickets. And in order to get tickets, I want to tell you about the best place, the smartest place, the easiest place to get them. And that, of course, my friends, is SeatGeek. Yes, SeatGeek, you all know by now, every place you want to get tickets to, SeatGeek has got them. And what SeatGeek tends to do is they figure out the marketplace, okay? They know what tickets are available and where they're available. And what they're going to do is go out of their way to figure out where the best deals are, and they're going to serve them to you on a silver platter. What you do when you get the SeatGeek app on your phone, you download that app, you type in the event, you type in the area you live in, whatever you want to do. I use it all the time. And... A seating chart will come up when you click on your event. It shows you what seats are available, and it actually rates the seats. So there's a ranking system. They're graded so that you know know how close they are to the action, whatever you want to see, based on the photo. But the color will tell you what the value of those seats in, what the value of the seats is. So if you're looking to get the best deal, you're going to get it. If you're looking just for the best seat, you're going to get it. And whichever, whichever way you're wanting to go, I'll tell you what I'll do for you. I will get you $20 off your first purchase. That's right. The deal just got even better. All you need to do is download that SeatGeek app. Enter promo code SAM today. That's promo code SAM, S-A-M, and you're going to get $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. What are you waiting for? I will get you tickets to whatever you need tickets for, and I will save you $20 on them. Download the SeatGeek app 
Enter promo code SAM and enjoy experiencing all of this for yourself. It's going to be amazing. Let's get back tomorrow, Ranallo. And And the funny thing is, guys, this is what really strange to me. It's almost like I remo- move my, I get out of my body and I see what I'm doing and I can't stop it. It's like watching a film. It's like watching it from another room and yeah. then you realize you've hurt a real person. Yes. Yeah. And you're like, oh no. But wh- so, but what I'm like, a lot of times they say, uh, you know, I, I've undergone uh, um, uh, blackout moments, I guess, where people have told me that, hey, this happened. And I'm like, wow, I don't remember that. But I remember even now, 20 years later, 25 years later, the what I was doing. So why did I do it? Why, you know, you don't, and, and so I get why you want to keep it quiet, why you want to just stay in your little corner of the world. But when I was doing that, that's when I was looking at the ceiling saying, okay, so I've been there. I've been suicidal and I have lost too many people to suicide. And judging by the feedback, both online, uh, emails and Twitter, there are people suffering right now that need to, to see what I'm putting out there. It's the rush of the anger. That's what it's that rush you get. It's like doing it's like doing a fucking popper. The rush of that anger. That's it that becomes more important than the person you're fucking hurting yeah. is keeping that high going. Yes. Oh, I, I, it's chasing the dry like when I was started my career at 16 out of high school. I was the, the right. promoter Al Tomko All-Star Wrestling was doing a charity show at my my high school and I from the womb was a pro wrestling fan and at 4 or 5 I visualized I visualized I'm going to work without knowing the term what it meant work for this company. I visualized being on American Network Television. I visualized calling the biggest fights in the world. I, I did visualize myself on stage telling jokes. Okay, I haven't done that yet, but it's like <laughs> I have, everything. but shouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> no, believe me, you are uh, amazing, my friend, and and uh, I love just like I say, even this conversation means a lot to me because it's it's cool to have someone also sharing what you're doing, and maybe you do a lot, which I appreciate. But for me, even looking back then. They were like, holy crap, you're a natural on the stick, your energy, this and that. But when I look at the interview, because we have VHS tapes from my TV show, my, my life has been on camera, all of it. Right. And so I'm like, holy crap, man, I look like I'm on cocaine or something. But it's it's just me, the, 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 the rush. So the documentary is Bipolar Rock and Roller, and it's Friday at 9 p.m. on Showtime. So in it, you talk about uh, a period that I was obviously aware of when... Because there were a couple of spots, Showtime was one of them, and WWE was another one, where you had to walk away, yep. and to your surprise, both organizations yep. called you and said, no, 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 we're going to find a spot for you, we're going to welcome you back in. So, because I'm so attached to the WWE sure. community, I was aware that when you kind of, uh, when you disappeared from WWE at first, people didn't know you had had a breakdown, people really, no. a lot of people didn't even know about the bipolar sure. thing, and what ended up happening was there was uh, a lot of scandals on the internet, and bullying mm-hmm. this, and other other people were getting blamed for that. Did you think that that was a fair thing, or were you kind of going like, this isn't true? What's yeah, being it, here? very tough time personally because it took me until the age of 46, and my best friend, Michael Jansen, who died at 19, who really, his death is what triggered my first meltdown that yeah. led to the diagnosis he a uh, heart attack believe it or not and his family all his two his sisters and his mom and dad just arrived today they're here for the premiere i call them every year no matter where i am july 6th the anniversary of his death but to to get to your quote the reason i say that when we were 18 i'll never forget i picked him up at, at his college class and all he said was i can't wait until you work for vince mcmahon so that was when he was 18 i it took me until i was 46 to get to wwe Incredible feedback, amazing. You talk about euphoria, you talk about the mania, the the run, you know, working with Jerry Lawler right away. Every incredible run. I quickly realized, wait a minute, as as tough as this schedule is, and those, you know it, my man. What the sports entertainers, these athletes, uh, fifty two weeks a year, guys. It's amazing, it's and I'm just an announcer. So take that and add. Showtime Championship Boxing, Bellator MMA, other VO. Like, I had this whole other two careers going on. I thought, I'm Superman. I can maintain. No, I, I, the, the schedule, the, 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 just the stress of doing all of it was starting to take its toll. I, I, and so, yes, you can, you know, I don't want to address anything else because all sure. of that is bullshit. And, and there were people that, of course, every working relationship you you have to navigate. You're not always going to get along with, with everybody the way you would like to get along with with your colleagues. But WWE, like you say, for all of its, you know, the, the giant corporation that it is and, 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 and anything you may have heard, Paul Levesque, Triple H, Michael Cole, uh, 
they called me and, and said, you know, we got to try. We know uh, the, the quote from Paul Levesque was, Moro, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I, I think, pro, you know, this business is in your DNA. I said, absolutely right. How can we make this work? And it's funny because when they first approached me and they said, we want you to come and work with us, I said, is it for NXT? <laughs> 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 I'm like, and that's, I, I love the underdog, the grind. The, so it, it worked out for the best. And I truly believe that this documentary, because I've heard from a lot of WWE folks, and yeah. honestly, whatever, it, it's hopefully going to help them as well because uh, all of us, we, we need to just release. And instead of... Jim, as we've discussed already, doing things harmful to ourselves or others. Just, hey, what, what's the question you hear most every day? Hey, how are you? What's up? Do we really mean it? Do we actually listen to the answer? And do we think about it? Do you want to hear the answer? Exactly. Would you, would you listen to yourself if you're watching a tape of a fight or something and you hear your own voice? Yep. Are you like, wow, I did a good job? Or do you think, no. like, I stink? Buddy, within minutes, I pick up the first mistake that I've made and it's fuck off. It's done. And I've, and, and whether it's, the, everyone's got our process. I hear a lot of performers, a lot of actors don't watch their work either. To me, it's it's releasing it, whatever it is, whether you like it or you don't, whether you like the pop culture references or the energy or you don't. To me, it's just, it's my therapy. It keeps me alive. So, no, I'm never satisfied. And honestly, even now, I got these headphones on listening. It's like people always say, man, do you always talk like that? Is that your voice? Yeah, it is. And I've always my well, you, you sound like an announcer. Well, I'm an announcer. I can talk <laughs> like this and maybe get some Disney work, I hope. Do a little voiceover work. No. And so I, I understand how everything is picked apart when we put ourselves out there. And mm -hmm. I truly understand how this is going to be scrutinized. But this is my magnum opus in terms of what I wanted to do for humanity and the fact that I've already hopefully saved or impacted in a positive way a few lives. That's fine. I'm willing to be a casualty for the cause. When you were going through, I mean, when you when you were working everywhere that you worked before you got to WWE yep. and you were you had your career, you already had your career, yeah. right? Yeah. Was there before you're 46 this feeling of like I still want to get to WWE, or was there more like no, I found my niche. I'm yeah. doing what I'm here to do. It, it, by the time I guess I hit the 40s, well, I guess before I did New Japan Pro Wrestling on Access TV, yeah. I probably still had. Well, you know, it'd be nice just to have that on my 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 resume. But when I did New Japan and the, the feedback I got for that, like I've always again, I don't I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be uh, what I, I wish. I love what I do. But it's, I don't need all the, the, the other stuff. So for me, I love that underground feel of even New Japan at the time. We're the, the, you know, the cool kids in the corner, as it were. And I, I um, satiated my, my pro wrestling uh, commentary. So by the time I did that, I was fine. So WWE, and it's funny, Michael Cole followed me on Twitter. And mm -hmm. I'm like, is this the guy? Is this Michael Cole? So I went. <laughs> and, and the email came shortly thereafter, and, and the rest, you know, they say is, is, is history. But Do you I, know who's the first guy who had an eye or an ear for you? That or I mean, did somebody tell Michael Cole? Was yeah, Michael Cole just I, aware? I believe that, uh, well, Paul Levesque, Triple H had heard, he, you know, he walked Floyd Mayweather to, to yeah, one of, of his fights, and he's a boxing fan. Michael Cole was actually a boxing fan. So uh, I believe that I'd maybe been on their radar for a bit, and then when they made the move to, to USA Network Live, uh, I guess, Yes, they wanted to bring someone in with a, maybe a little bit of cachet. When I put together the sizzle reel, you'll appreciate this, Jim. I, I also was asked um, um, Warren Buffett every year at his shareholders meeting, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, they do this entertainment video of him. Well, the year when I, how many years, a couple years now, he, he fought Floyd Mayweather at MGM Grand. They literally got in the ring. They filmed this thing with all these celebrities talking. And I'm the voice of the, the fight. And I'm mad living, you know, me making my whatever comments, riffing off this thing. And, um, and and Vince McMahon saw that and went, holy shit! If he can sell that, I mean, we'll, 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 get we'll, we'll get him. Do you have Did a moment you start? Do you have a moment you look back on and go like, oh god, that was the fucking. Worst. Like, is there a moment yes. you look back on and broadcast that yes. is your worst? Yes. What? September, two thousand seven, I believe. Hawaii, Gina Carano, Tanya Evinger. Um, Tanya Evinger had said on the uh, the press conference, "I'm here. I, w I wish I could make out with Gina, but I'm here to knock her out. She's open sure. gay. That's fine, you know." And at the time, even it was great to see that kind of uh, conversation going. There was a lull in the fight, and uh, uh, I used the quote on the air, just say, "Hey, this provocative quote." 
And so I say, and Bill Goldberg, my broadcast partner, I'm not going to touch that with a 25-foot pole. And I instantly, again, trying to be creative, ad-lib, go nuts, trying to make I, – even the, even my original intention was still stupid and, and, and gauche and should never have been done. But I said, oh, I wouldn't mind – if they're going to kiss, I wouldn't mind touching with a 25-centimeter pole, meaning I'd like to be yeah. close to see them kiss. Yeah. Obviously, sure. it became where everyone thought well, I was referring to – the you male did. part of my yeah. anatomy, yeah. thank you, and and so and I I was I was destroyed, and I know how upset and rightfully so Gina and Tanya were. Uh, by the grace of God, they're both class acts, and Gina Carano is is just one of the most amazing human beings I've ever met, and we were able to put that be- behind us. I hope, but I I did lose a show. I was suspended, rightfully so. My Showtime could have lost my entire gig, but again, the. Uh, the understanding being what was my stupid original intention. And in a court of law, I probably would be found guilty anyway of trying to, to sell what I was originally trying to do. But even that was stupid. So that was the, the, the low point for me as a broadcaster. Did you see the, I'm sure you've seen it, the video that uh, WWE put out from the, the pinhole camera in the wow. announce table? You, yes, I have. And, and even that, it's funny, family so friends who've known me forever say, What's the big deal? <laughs> <laughs> we know that like it's like everyone just figuring this out now, but it's yeah, it's so definitely WWE has a there's a pinhole camera in all the announcers tables. It's really just used for communication between the back sure. and the front, but they record everything. And so I guess they saw this and Takeover, saw what man. Morrow was doing at the table in New yeah. Orleans. And I mean when he's doing his commentary, he's up, he's standing, he's jumping, he's throwing his arms. Sure. Yeah, I mean he is really yeah. emoting. And I guess they hadn't seen anything like this before, so they put out a montage of just Morrow. You can't even see the action. You yeah, just, just see hear my call and see it. Morrow's physical, everything. Manic, and, mania. And it went, it's gone Yeah, it's going everywhere. crazy. People, and, and, and it's funny how many people, hey, in fact, how many haters have said, wow, it is genuine. It is, wow, well, I, <laughs> I have a new respect for you, sir. And, and I'm like, it's, I, I mean, I appreciate that. But again, there is that tinge of mania. Right, and I believe it's okay. The same thing well, you can you you can you can yes. you can utilize it, right? You can you can tunnel it and, sure. and push it through this constructed yes. thing. It's just it once the show's over is when you have to then start to deal uh, with it. Right? Yes, the it, same thing that makes you so good at that yes. is the same thing that will make you go home and hear that Robin Williams hung himself Fuck. and go, "I admire his courage." Buddy. That's amazing, man. When he died, I was fl- – because I've, I've been – who isn't? I've been a sure. walking, talking uh, a tribute to, to Robin Williams. Love the guy. And, in fact, got to meet his son, Cody. And even that – it's so – it's the forced gump of broadcasting I try to, to call myself sometimes. I, I but, he, but he when, – when he died, people right away all, – all of a sudden, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Because – it was weird that it took, like, again, a giant of the, the entertainment industry to take his life knowing what he was suffering through. So that's the other reason for the doc. Here I am. I'm not going to—I'm not dead, but I want—and and I hope to God I, I die a peaceful, you know, death in my sleep sure. at 111 years old, Mr. Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> but, but see, his—look at what—why uh, did he have to die for, for everyone to say, how are you? Are you okay? Are you okay? Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's we don't need to lose anymore. We've lost enough. Let's, let's keep this conversation going like this. And yeah. the documentary, let's promote it properly. Bipolar rock and roller. You're such an open guy, and you're so uh, revealing. It's on Showtime this Friday, nine o'clock, and it's Moro Ronaldo on Twitter. Yeah, and it's uh, I'm 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 really glad you did this, and I know that uh, uh, in my wife's family, she's uh, has a family member that uh, suffers from the same mm. thing, and I watched this with her, and at first she goes, I don't I don't want to see this. It's yeah. too close to yeah, home for sure. Uh, but she watched the whole thing, and she like it. It 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 finally, even though there is a human sure. face to it for her and for I, and and it's it's to see the highs, the lows, mm. to see you in these private moments mm. is like okay, we're starting to wrap around, yeah. and this idea that like where some people go like, well, it's a it's a cry for attention, it's yes. this, it's that. Morrow's story is so great because you've got a guy that is so singularly focused yeah. on this goal, yeah. and. Bipolar is so destructive <laughs> to that goal <laughs> that he wouldn't be. Yeah. This isn't. It doesn't make sense that no, this would doesn't. be a cry for attention because it's... all Morrow wants to do is what he's doing, yeah. and all he's got is this yeah. thing in his oh, brain. And don't, and don't get me wrong. That again, Andy Kaufman, another yes. idol of mine. And even when watching it, to be honest, I'm like, I, I can. It's because I'm so warped. I think yeah, I can see where people go. Wow, this is a pretty interesting piece of performance art, but. Why I'm sabotaging my own thought process. You guys mean I, I go? Yeah. yeah, I can see where people see. I'm people a are going to think this whole thing exactly. Work. Yeah. It's a work. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a, a work. work. It, but it makes it harder. <laughs> the attention you'd get from it does not outweigh the negative of what it does. Sure, absolutely not. And that's why 
uh, as much as it even uh, hurts me to the core to say, you know, I love kids. I love people, obviously. I, I want to help people, but I, I, I just can't imagine having a loved one like my child go what, what, through what I go through because I know what is done to my parents, even my brothers, and all of my friends. Like the ripple effect, the, the toll it takes on those who really care is, oh, man, it's gut-wrenching. Well, everybody's got to watch yes. this movie. Bipolar Rock and Roller, Friday, 9 p.m. Morrow. So glad you came Oh, by. man, Thank this you, has man. been a thrill, guys. And uh, Sam, always a pleasure working with you, of course. And Jim, honestly, man, uh, big fan of all your work. And thank you thank for you. being so kind. It's and, nice uh, to meet you and, as well. And caring. I, I really appreciate, appreciate it. it, Jim. Hey, Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast listeners. This is Wade Keller from Pro Wrestling Torch. You might have heard me on Sam's show. If you enjoy our conversations on pro wrestling, be sure to check out my shows. They drop four times per week. We have two shows early in the week, the post shows following Raw and SmackDown. We talk to an on-site correspondent about things that did not air in crowd reaction and also have a co-host, live callers, and a mailbag segment. And then later in the week, my two shows on Podcast One are the Thursday Flagship and Interview Friday. Just search Wade Keller in Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or anywhere else to listen to Pro Wrestling Podcasts. That's Wade Keller. Subscribe to both the red logo and the blue logo. Here is Sam Roberts. So Mauro Ranallo, and if you guys, I, I know we plugged it a whole bunch during the interview, but I really have to encourage you all to go out of your way to see Bipolar Rock and Roller. It really gives you a tremendous insight on who Mauro is and his journey to get here and what he goes through on a day-to-day basis. You know, it, it's uh, it's interesting watching the video of him kind of losing his mind there at ringside in the context of what we see. And it's and it's and it's really interesting to watch a guy be able to channel so much of what goes on in his brain through his work. You know, I think that that's a blessing when you are suffering the way Morrow is, but you can figure out a way to channel it for at least part of the time uh, to do something productive. I think that that's a that's a gift. So thank you again tomorrow, and make sure that you watch the uh, the documentary when you get a chance. Uh, okay, we have a lot to break down in the state of wrestling this week. Uh, everything from uh, TV deals. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. You, the the build the money in the bank. You got uh, so much stuff going on. It is it is a very interesting time. To be a wrestling fan, you know, you've got on a week to week basis, you got weird stuff happening on TV sometimes. I think some of the stuff happening on TV is great. You got great matches happening, but then you got segments that you're just like, what are you thinking? But in the grand scheme of things, wrestling is in a really good place. You know, we'll talk about this more in the state of wrestling, but I did hear there were people trying to, for some reason, shape this announcement about the WWE and SmackDown going to Fox as something that's not simply a positive for wrestling fans. And I think that that's pessimistic, to say the least, to think that this isn't a positive thing. Like, big news for WWE is good news for wrestling fans. When WWE is succeeding, the wrestling business in the United States and abroad is succeeding. So I I don't think that there's any reason to try to figure out why when WWE reports something, it's not great news for all of us, you know? I mean, I understand that we're not sitting there making the money off of this, but that's not what it's about. It's about the health of the business. And all we can do is analyze it and see that the health of the pro wrestling business is in a really, really good place. And the same reason why... Cody and the Young Bucks selling out their all-in tickets in 29 minutes is great, not just for Cody and the Young Bucks, but for wrestling in general. The fact that there's that kind of interest in this stuff is great for all of us, is the same reason why, on an even bigger level, WWE signing a billion-dollar deal with Fox and, you know, making a whole bunch more money for Raw is a tremendous win for all of us wrestling fans because not only is it proving, at with the all-in example, that fans are still interested, but we go over to the WWE's example and it's proving that industry 
industry is interested. And that's where pro wrestling for so many years uh, has not been able to be successful. They have not, the industry is not taken seriously enough by the entertainment industry, by mainstream. You know, wrestling is has been, is still kind of looked at as a joke. And it's moves like this that prove that wrestling is in a very, very different place, that the WWE is a uh, is an entertainment company worth covering, worth looking at, you know, and that Vince McMahon is one of these guys that say what you want about him. But if you look up to anybody in business, if you look up to a Walt Disney, if you look up to a Steve Jobs, if you look up to maybe even an Elon Musk, you got to look up to Vince McMahon and respect him for what he's been able to accomplish. So let's get into that and a whole lot more. Ladies and gentlemen, let's start this week's State of Wrestling. It's now time for this week's State of Wrestling. And welcome everybody to the State of Wrestling here on Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. As always, there's a lot to get into. You know how we do things on the State of Wrestling. We break down the top five stories of the week according to yours truly, the last professional broadcaster, Sam Roberts, and we count down to what I feel is the biggest story there is. So we'll start with number five. Story number five this week is, uh, it's technically a rumor. I I try not to do rumors too much. I try to just do stories. There's a couple of rumors on the list this week just because they're big enough and they've been talked about enough that they're worth having discussions about. And that's the whole point of what we do here in State of Wrestling. So... Story number five is the rumored report that going forward, all WWE pay-per-views will be four hours with shows like SummerSlam and maybe Survivor Series and Royal Rumble being five and then WrestleMania being, actually they're extending WrestleMania to 19 hours. 19 hours is how long next year's WrestleMania will be. But big, big pay-per-views will be five plus and the other pay-per-views will be four, apparently starting with Money in the Bank. Now, this has not been confirmed. I have not seen this anywhere in writing, but enough people are talking about it that we should talk about it. So the first question is, like, how are we going to stay up that late? So many people watching these pay-per-views have kids, have jobs that they have to get to, and one Sunday a month to be up until at least midnight, plus then the after show is 12.30. You're talking about going to bed at 1 o'clock, getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning. It's not going to work out well. So WWE has seen that problem, and they've decided that apparently, rumor has it, that these pay-per-views are going to start an hour earlier. So Money in the Bank, whatever the pay-per-view is in July, the September show, the I guess all pay-per-views really, will start at 7 p.m. Eastern instead of 8 p.m. Eastern theoretically with the kickoff show starting at 6 p.m. Eastern because we all know none of us want to see the kickoff shows go away. Am I right? I swear. It's not in just because it's in my best interest. I just think the kickoff shows are great regardless. It helps that I'm sitting at the desk most of the time, but either way, I think it's important. So uh, I think that this is the right move. So it's really tough, and it's interesting watching the build to Money in the Bank Clearly, a lot more is being put into it than any non-WrestleMania, SummerSlam, Royal Rumble pay-per-view, probably all year, and certainly a lot more than Backlash. Backlash had huge problems, a lot of that being because, number one, they did the, uh, 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 you know, the, the superstar shakeup, screwed everything up. Number two, big problem, they uh, had only one week to build it, so... Backlash was technically the first dual-branded pay-per-view, but I don't think that it's representative of the system that we have going forward. I don't think it's fair to make Backlash representative of what the dual-branded pay-per-views will be, and that's because we still had the schedule of single-branded pay-per-views. We hadn't gone through the process, which WWE did, of eliminating pay-per-views off the calendar so that they could space their shows out properly to just have... 12 to have one show a month instead of one show every three weeks or so so and there's and that's a big big difference we had wrestlemania a couple of weeks later we had the greatest royal rumble a week after that we had backlash that does not set up backlash in a position to succeed but 
The fact that we had like six weeks between Backlash and Money in the Bank gives us plenty of time to make Money in the Bank succeed. I think watching Money in the Bank, still another, I don't know, three weeks at least from now, watching Money in the Bank is going to give us the best interpretation of what these pay-per-views are going to look like going forward. And if it's true that they're starting an hour earlier, I definitely think that's better. If you're going to do four-hour shows or even three-and-a-half-hour shows, once you hit 11 o'clock, it starts to get like, you start to feel like you did uh, watching that show coming from Newark, New Jersey. When the audience clearly was like, we signed up to stay until 11, like, we got kids here, we got to go. And that's the other thing. You're talking about a product that is, being pitched as family friendly kids got to go to school on a monday man you can't have kids hanging out in an arena till midnight unless it's a very very special occasion like wrestlemania so i definitely think that it's the right move i also i mean i think it'll be cooler to have shows on earlier on a sunday night i like the idea of people getting around and having their dinner with the pay-per-view and you know the, 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 even if the kids go to bed early if you have real little kids they can watch the first couple hours of the show it could be fun I don't mind the idea of these shows starting earlier. I don't necessarily mind the idea of the shows being four hours. I think that you have to fill the four hours, though. You know, I, I think that if you're if you're going to s switch and you're going to make these shows four hours long, I think it is super important that you make it feel like these shows have to be four hours long. If you're going to make every pay-per-view four hours, people have to leave those pay-per-views going... Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have, there's, there is not an hour of show that I would shave down. And it's interesting because we've heard it about Raw for years now that three hours is too long. And originally, the defense to that was, look, we're trying our best. But I mean, even Triple H would do interviews where he would say three hours is a long time to watch anything. A three hour movie, it's tough to keep people entertained for that amount of time. So now you're tacking on every month an hour to that and making a four-hour show. There is enough to fill four-hour shows. I mean, especially with shows like Money in the Bank and stuff like that, but four-hour shows will enable you to really flush out some stories coming from both SmackDown and Raw. Let's be honest. A lot of the single-brand pay-per-views, you could have shaved an hour off of them. A lot of the single-brand pay-per-views had moments, but many were underwhelming. So I think the idea that... Once a month, each brand is going to put together two amazing hours and mix it up. It's not like the first two hours are SmackDown, the second two hours are Raw. But all told, if it's a four-hour show, you're assuming you're going to get about two hours of content from Raw and two hours of content from SmackDown. So I don't think that it's unreasonable to sit there and say, hey, every month we need to have these stories come to a crescendo with two hours of amazing content. I think that it's very, very possible. And like I said, I think Money in the Bank is going to be the proving ground. Right now, you've got your two Money in the Bank matches, which people are going to love because Money in the Bank has a similar appeal to the Royal Rumble in that as soon as somebody wins those matches, you start to concoct what your plans are going forward. Like it's a clear indication something is going to happen as a result of these matches. So you got your two Money in the Bank matches where you could easily have the men's Money in the Bank match main eventing the show. That could be the last match on the show, specifically if Braun Strowman wins. If there's one thing we learned about Backlash, it's that results of matches, it is important. The result of the match is very important when figuring out where it's going to go on the card. It wouldn't have it would have been a terrible idea at Backlash to have AJ and Nakamura go on last based on the finish. A double nut kick, 10 count draw, bad idea, you know. If we're going to go to uh Money in the Bank and in this last man standing match, we're going to have uh you know, a double nut kick again and both guys stay down for the 10 count cuz here's the issue. If you have the exact same match under last man standing rules, as you did at Backlash, you get the exact same result. Both guys were down for 10. If they knock each other down for 10, you could end up having a, a draw, which is an issue because it's like usually, you know, if, if a match uh, ends in interference, then they say, okay, the next one's going to be in a cage because now there can't be interference. Okay, but you're bouncing off of a match that ended in a draw 
by having a match where you could literally have the exact same thing ha- happen. You won't, but it's just not a, a point that you can make in building this match. Um, so I'll go over my predictions and stuff for Money in the Bank as it gets closer, but just in terms of you know what can go on last and where, like who knows? Who knows? But there's a lot going on at this Money in the Bank show. There's no reason to think it can't fill four hours, especially with the two Money in the Bank matches, the world title match. You got Roman and Jinder. You got the SmackDown tag title match. You'd assume there's going to be a Raw tag title match. Uh, Ronda versus Nia Jax, which we'll talk about later on when we when we go over what happened on Raw this week. Uh, a lot. A lot. So it'll be interesting to see how WWE handles all that going forward uh, and whether they can maintain four hours a month. I, I think they can. It's just a matter of if they will. So... It remains to be seen, but it's going to be very, very interesting. Speaking of shows and and televised stuff, story number four does not is not a fact. Story number four is a another conversation, but this one is not rumors. Story number four is based on tweets that were going out from Cody Rhodes' account this week, uh, conversations that were had about All In, and the question being: After this ten thousand seat arena in Chicago sold out in twenty nine and a half minutes. Will there be a way for people who are not in Chicago to watch All In? Is All In going to be on pay-per-view? Is All In going to be streaming? You know, what's going to happen with this? And Cody said that there were no plans right now to televise this show, but that's not to say that there, sh- that there will not be plans to televise. That's not to say the show is not going to be televised. That's simply to say, as of this time, plans have not been made. I firmly believe I have no inside information but I firmly believe that all in will be televised to some extent I would imagine streamed let's look at at the entertainment version of all in okay you had a guy let's look at it in terms of comedy Louis CK reached a point in his career where he realized that just as an entity just him by himself, had become a draw. He did not need to sign any major deals. You know, he did sign with FX, but FX let him do whatever he wanted on his sitcom. So in terms of his comedy specials, what did he do? He was really the first to put out his comedy special on his website, on his own, filmed it himself, put it up on the website for download, five bucks for the show, and people came out in droves. Not only did it make him a ton of money but it changed the industry in the sense that people who are as big as him people who are not as big as him people who really probably should get some kind of vehicle behind them a lot of people turn around and started doing this the exact same way as louis did so uh i think that uh that is something to look at in terms of what all in will be in my personal opinion i believe that all in will be available I believe that it will not be on pay-per-view because All In is kind of a symbol of newness. Everything about All In is new media. I believe that All In will be made available to stream on the All In website, whether it's All In Show or All In Wrestling or All In whatever. I think that they're going to set up a website and you're going to be able to pay to watch All In and hopefully download it and keep it. Similar to what MLW does. MLW does these big shows. Uh, The past few have been in Orlando, I think. They're doing one in New York uh, this summer. But MLW, they do the shows. They don't stream them live, but they make them available for download uh, a few days after the show. I believe that because All In is such a to-do, they will figure out a way to stream it live. It will be done probably with a partner who's got experience in this, but not through, you know, I don't think it'll be done through Ring of Honor. I don't think it'll be done through High Spots or anything like that. I think that this show will be streamed independently on the All In website. And if I had to, if I had to put money, money on it, that is where I think people will be able to see it. And I think you have to. I think in this day and age, when you have the kind of interest in your product that these guys do, you'd be foolish, foolish, I say, to not stream it some way, shape, or form. You'd be foolish to not make it available to more people. It doesn't take anything away. I don't think anybody that bought tickets to this show will be bummed out if you televise it in some way, shape, or form. 
I think that people go to this show and are going to this show live for the same reason that they go to any live wrestling show. For the same reason why WrestleMania sells out every year and nobody sits there going like, oh, it's on the network? Oh, but I bought tickets. I thought this was the only way to see it. No way. It's not going to hurt business at all. It's not going to piss anybody off. People are still going for the four-day StarCast Festival or however long it is. The events that they've put together for that thing are insane. And for what this show is, what it symbolizes, what it can be, just to experience it live, to be there in Chicago for the first time. So I think there's a lot of people that want to be a part of it, that want to contribute to it, that want to see it. And so I think that, that internet streaming will be the way that All In is made available. And speaking of All In, that brings me to story number three this week. And story number three is a new story coming out of the All In press conference. Uh, the All In boys, it was uh, Cody Rhodes and the Young Bucks, and I think Tessa Blanchard was there and Marty Scarl and uh, uh, all kinds of people. The, 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 the Bear, the All In Bear, and all those people. They were at this press conference uh, announcing, you know, what was to be expected at All In and that Cody Rhodes would be going for the NWA championship and all this stuff. What we find out this week is apparently, and again, this is just rumor, apparently CM Punk may or may not have been backstage at the All In press conference. Now, people are going crazy with rumors and concoctions and reasoning and rationale. The presiding story is that, of course, I mean, we got to keep in mind, the all-in press conference was in Chicago, which is CM Punk's hometown. The all-in press conference was at the Pro Wrestling Tees retail store and, you know, factory space, which CM Punk has a relationship with. So the idea that he was there meeting up with his friends picking up some t-shirts maybe because he's going to sell them at a convention or whatever, maybe having a conversation about the uh, meet and greet that's coming up for All In. Not only plausible, but probable. That's probably why he was there. But he could have done that anytime. He knew very well, if he was there, that the All In press conference was going to be going on at that specific time. There is no doubt in my mind that if CM Punk was in that building at that time, it was to handle personal business, but it was also because he was interesting, interested in what was going on, what the feeling was, and just picking up a vibe for what the All In show was. Uh, he is confirmed to be doing a meet and greet. I think that already sold out or something. No, no shocker there at Pro Wrestling Tees that weekend. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I think that all signs point to he will probably do something at the All In show. Will he wrestle? No. I don't think there's any chance that you see CM Punk wrestling at All In. But I do think that there's a chance that he enters a wrestling ring with a microphone for the first time since abruptly leaving WWE at All In. I think that there is a I think that there is a, a big chance of that. Now, some people are saying that they're buying tickets to All In with the expectation that CM Punk is going to be doing something at this show. I think that that is the wrong move. I think we're far from guaranteed that CM Punk is going to do anything. I would say the chances are better than 50% that he's going to come out there and say something to the audience, but I don't think they're that much better than 50%. Passing is still 65. I don't know if I'd put the chances of seeing... At, at, at this day, today when I say this to you here in May, I don't think the chances are maybe not even passing, maybe not even 65% that he will be in the house for All In. But today I put them better at 50%. Today I put them better at 50% that he will be at All In and he will do some kind of a promo. Again, not a match, some kind of a promo. That said, I don't think it's something that it's fair to be disappointed if he doesn't. You know, I, I think that uh, the, the, the boys handling All In have done nothing to make people believe that CM Punk will be there. They have, they have announced so many people. They've announced Rey Mysterio. It doesn't seem like this is going to be a show where a ton of surprises happen. It seems like this is going to be a show where they deliver a special night. I mean, where they promise a special night and they deliver but we kind of know what to expect. 
Um, if there is a CM Punk surprise, I think only better. But I think that that's what it'll be. It's it's extra credit if we get. It. So I I don't think that it's at all fair to say that him sitting him potentially and possibly being in the house for that press conference. Uh, I don't think it means anything. I don't think it means that he's going to be there. Uh, but if you want to find meaning in it, I think you can make the safe assumption that he cares. He's aware. He's interested. I think the chances that he is interested in what's happening with All In are better than 65%. I would say there is an 85% to 90 maybe even percent chance that CM Punk is aware and interested in what's happening with All In. So, will he be there? I think so. But time will tell. Time will tell, and that's how we'll know. All right, guys. Let's get into story number two. And the reason this ranks high on my list is because I got a lot of tweets. I got a lot of tweets at Not Sam coming from Raw. And it said, Sam, please. Some people were asking as a request. Some people were making a challenge. Some people were even going so far as to call it a dare. I dare you, Sam, to make sense of this Sami Zayn, Bobby Lashley segment. I dare you. How is this happening? It has to be a rip. Tell me that WWE is goofing around because on the heels of announcing the biggest TV deal in the history of the company, people turn on the TV and they see, first they see a segment that's based on an interview that was like from another dimension weird where Bobby Lashley is looking into the camera and just talking about his sisters. Then... We see this segment with Sami Zayn uh, that is just a mockery of wrestling. Just the idea that like, oh, look, we just signed a giant TV deal and this is what we put on. What? Really? Now, I want to go over all of Raw. Before we get to the Sami segment, I want to sit here and tell you that this is a casualty of a three-hour Raw. There were many good moments in Raw this week. Raw had moments where it shined. I think overall people did not like Raw this week. I can't argue if you didn't like the show overall. But what I can argue is that it wasn't all bad. Uh, Look at the B team, okay? Anybody that says they don't love the B team, I don't even know if I want to talk to you. The B team is shining. They are taking their moment of opportunity and running with it. It is a matter of time, in my opinion, before WWE shop is stocking t-shirts that look like a big B was drawn on them with a Sharpie. They come to the ring. They're coloring each other's shirts in. It's amazing. The celebration they have after winning. Now, I do think that Raw needs to spend more time uh, strengthening their tag team division, but one way they can do that is by getting this B team over. I thought they were I thought they were incredible. I love the celebration after the match. I think even on the WWE's YouTube channel, they released a video of uh, extended footage of the celebration. But them taking the commentator chair and uh and jumping on the chair together and sliding down the ramp and getting all excited for each other. I mean, as much as it's a goof, you see and feel the passion for the business that Curtis Axel and Bo Dallas had, you know, that's what's contagious about it. It's hilarious. It's entertaining. It's fun to watch. And you feel good being a fan of it. You feel like these guys care on some level. They're committing to their performance, which you can't say about everybody. So the B team was great. Okay. I thought uh, the main event was incredible. Like another match where both guys come out looking so much better then they came in. Finn Balor versus Braun Strowman was a terrific match. I was in bed, okay? I wake up about 5, 5.20 in the morning every single morning. I got a radio show, and if I don't, uh, by Monday night, so Sunday night I'm always screwed up because I don't sleep early. I, I my Naturally, my body falls asleep late and likes to sleep in. So every weekend I get all screwed up. By Sunday, I don't fall asleep till 12. You know, I get about five hours of sleep. So by Monday is when I should be making up on that stuff. So I'm in bed by 10.30, and there are plenty of nights where I've got to turn off Raw early and I watch on uh, DVR the next day after I get home from work. 
I was ready. Okay. I was in bed by 10, 20, 10, 25, ready to turn it off before the main event was over. Cause I go, okay, I can watch the main event match at the end of, at the end, you know, I, I, I the next day I can watch the main event match the next afternoon. But they brought it in, okay, I, I was, you know, the, you had the Elias thing happen. Braun Strowman knocks out Elias, and there is a an easy, almost like a cross-dissolve into this main event segment. So that hooks me in, and I'm like, okay, let me see where this goes. And just in terms of a matching of style, a matching of sizes, I'm interested in watching what Finn Balor and Braun Strowman look like together. I'm interested in hearing what the crowd reaction will be uh, to two of the most beloved superstars on the roster duking it out. Uh, I was so impressed with the match. It stayed on completely till the end. And it wasn't even one of those things where it was like it ended and I fell right to sleep. I was buzzed after that match. It was a great match. Finn Balor versus Braun Strowman. And I tell you, they had the opportunity. If on some level the WWE was not serious about Finn Balor, they certainly had the opportunity to make Braun Strowman look dominant and to keep Finn Balor as sort of a middle-of-the-road good guy superstar. That isn't what happened at all. Finn Balor looked stronger than ever. Finn Balor looked like, okay, he made a mistake, Tonight was Braun Strowman's night. But watching that match, you could sit there and say that if they were to have a rematch, Finn Balor could win. There were many times in that match where I was like, oh my God, what are they doing here? Is Finn Balor getting pushed back into the main event scene? Is Finn Balor going to win this match? I just thought the back and forth, the up and down, the variety of moves, Braun Strowman being strong, like that that one where uh, Braun Strowman is doing his lap around the ring to shoulder check uh, Finn Balor and Finn Balor runs around and I don't remember the name of the move I'm not a commentator but he does the deal where he puts him in the sleeper hold and swings him down to the ground and then rolls in the ring I just thought so much of that stuff was so so cool you know the coup de gras off the ring off the uh, guardrail off the barrier there the crowd barrier awesome 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 so Finn Balor versus Braun Strowman uh, definitely on the short list of great raw matches in 2018 uh, and just just a terrific time, in my personal opinion. And then, I'll tell you this. I gained a new appreciation for the Nia Jax-Ronda Rousey match watching this contract signing. Stephanie coming back, her being there, the stare-off. I believed Ronda when she said, I'm going to take your title, then I'm going to take your arm. Uh, uh, everything. Everything about it. Nia Jax' uh, per- per- performance was great. You know, kind of being the cocky champion. Not so much that she's a heel. Like, she didn't do damage to the character that she's been building, in my opinion. But she did sort of make it seem like, who do you think you are, Ronda Rousey? In case you forgot, I'm not like most girls, okay? I'm the champion of Raw women. What are you going to do about it? You know, she didn't seem intimidated at all. So, and, and you know, I think Ronda, I think WrestleMania probably injected uh, a dose of confidence into Ronda Rousey and has uh, given her a little bit of a better idea of who she is as a performer because she didn't seem lost out there like she did at moments leading to the WrestleMania match. And as far as the match with Nia Jax goes, I really don't have any worries about it. I think that uh, clearly Ronda has been training hard. I think that we have enough time that we announced this match now a week and a half ago. We still got whatever, two and a half, three and a half weeks before uh, Money in the Bank, you know, I think that this is going to be a a match where there's a lot of training and choreography that's gone into it, the same way I'm sure WrestleMania was, but that's the way it should be. And watching this thing, it looked like a main event, okay? And it was a reminder of what a big star Ronda Rousey is and what a great opponent for her Nia Jax is. Now, at one point, when it was first announced a week and a half ago, I go, and I said this last week on the podcast, I said, to me, it's pretty clear uh, that uh, Natty is going to come in and cause a disqualification. In my mind, uh, she would go in, she would hit, uh, what's her face, um, Nia Jax. She would hit Nia Jax with something, cause Nia Jax to win via disqualification, and you know, and then Ronda's going like, what are you doing? And Nanny's like, I had your back. I was helping you. Uh, the only reason, my only hiccup with that is that I don't know 
maybe they'll find a way organically for Nia Jax, I mean, for Ronda Rousey to get jumped by Natty. So the disqualification thing is weird. I think most likely Ronda would lose by disqualification, but on one end, you don't want Ronda to lose matches, but on the other end, you don't want her to get jumped and get laid out by Natty either. So I don't know exactly what you do there. Uh, Some people are theorizing that the plan is for Natty to win the Money in the Bank briefcase earlier in the night and then cash in on Ronda Rousey. Now, I have a couple problems with that theory. Number one, the spacing of the matches would lead you to believe that Ronda Rousey is going on towards the end. Uh, And I think if Ronda Rousey, you're not, if it is the last match, you're not ending that pay-per-view with Natty beating Ronda Rousey for the championship. It's just not going to happen. Ronda Rousey is too valuable. Uh, I also just don't see Ronda losing, even in a Money in the Bank briefcase cash-in scenario. I don't see that happening right now. It's her first singles match. I think she really needs to be established as a dominant competitor, and I just don't see her winning and losing the title in her first two matches. You know, I just don't, I don't see that happening. I do see this building towards a match with Natty, but... I don't see Natty cashing in and beating Ronda Rousey at Money in the Bank. I don't think it makes sense for the investment that's been made in Ronda Rousey. I'll tell you this. Monday Night Raw was the first time where I looked at it and said, I could see Ronda Rousey winning the Raw Women's Championship at Money in the Bank. And I'll tell you this. If that match goes on at the end of the pay-per-view, Ronda Rousey is going home with the championship. That's my prediction. I think, just like I talked about odds, I think there are better odds than you think that Ronda Rousey could win the Women's Championship and leave with the Women's Championship at uh, at Money in the Bank. Who knows? You could have a thing where Natty comes in and cashes in on Ronda, and Ronda beats her. Natty could cash in unsuccessfully, and it would lead to a, to a rivalry between Natty and Ronda, Because Ronda is like, why did you cash in on me at my most vulnerable moment? And Natty's like, why did you ruin this for me? And eventually, you know, they have a match that's not a briefcase match. They have a real match. Um, So a lot of things could happen. But that segment was the first time I looked at it and said, wow. I could see Ronda Rousey being the Raw Women's Champion. And I'm finding myself excited about this match. So I thought that that segment was was, was very, very effective on Raw on Monday. The Sami Zayn, Bobby Lashley segment, sometimes segments are bad enough that they kind of uh, make you forget about all the good stuff on the show. Look, same thing happened with Bailey, This Is Your Life. And I'll tell you, and this is the shame, Bailey, This Is Your Life was an Alexa Bliss segment. And it was bad, it didn't work, but Alexa Bliss was and is a master. Alexa Bliss is so good, so so good uh, on the microphone that like you couldn't sit there and watch This Is Your Life, Bailey, and blame it on Alexa for screwing up. I would say the exact same thing about Sami Zayn in the Bobby Lashley sisters segment, that there was nothing about that segment that I look at it and go, Sami Zayn was not the right person for this because Sami Zayn took really bad material and did the best he possibly could with it. There were some people saying that this was transphobic because it was obviously men in dresses and and one of them had a mustache and blah, blah, blah. I don't think it was transphobic. I think that, you know, it was was an old gag of dressing, you know, big burly dudes in dresses, you know, just to be like, hey, these are your sisters that you were talking about. And, you know, Bobby can say my sister doesn't have a mustache. I think to say transphobic is a little bit of a stretch. And I think at that point we're taking pro wrestling way too seriously if that's your issue. Um, what I do think is, is that the writers that are hired for WWE or the ones making the decisions, who knows? You know, we always blame writers. uh, We always blame the creative team. We don't exactly know who writes what. We don't exactly know who approves what. We don't exactly know who's to blame when a segment doesn't work. But watching that segment, I got the same feeling I got watching This Is Your Life, Bailey, which is... You are trying to recreate old uh, segments on Monday Night Raw. There have been great skit segments in ring on Monday Night Raw. But a lot of those really good ones 
were done in an era where things weren't so heavily scripted and were done in an era when performers themselves could put themselves into their work. This is your life, Bailey, and these are your sisters, Bobby. Both play like comedy skits written by people who are not comedy writers. There's a whole different thing. I am not discrediting the writers of WWE. Okay, these are and and you know I I get that they're that it's easy to just blame the writers because there's no faces to the names. It's just this sort of anonymous group. But I mean the job that these writers do, they're writing five hours of TV every single week. People lose their minds because they go, I can't believe SNL is 90 minutes of live TV every single week and all week long you have to write this show. It's 90 minutes. WWE is doing five hours of TV and their team of writers is writing that around the clock and answering, by the way, to a Lorne Michaels type in Vince McMahon. Not an easy thing to do. Okay? So, but I think it has to be said that when it comes to writers... A TV writer cannot always just drift from genre to genre to genre. There are people who specialize in comedy writing. Comedians and comedy writers are a different breed of people. And if you're going to do comedy segments, it is necessary that the WWE have comedy writers on staff. And if you're going to do a skit, go to an improv, go to a UCB, go to, you know, one of these places... And hire guys that have an appreciation for wrestling, but also are trained in comedy writing. Because it was not comedy what I saw on Raw this week. It wasn't funny. It was awkward and weird. And I felt for, I felt bad for both Sammy and Bobby. Because Bobby was obviously working under instructions because I didn't get him at all. Like, why are you even smiling for a second? You know, last week your sisters meant the world to you. And this week, it's kind of like you're not taking it so seriously when Sami Zayn is making a mockery of your family, you know? And you can kick his ass. Look how much bigger you are than he is. So I I, I didn't get why Bobby wasn't more angry. Bobby, the character Bobby. And, you know, I, I Sami Zayn did everything Sami Zayn could have done with what he had. But it wasn't a good segment. It didn't work. Um... You know, I don't know how they get the Sami Zayn, Bobby Lashley story back on track. It seems like they just introduced this concept of Bobby Lashley's sisters so they could get to this skit, and this skit would be the heat needed to bring us to a fever pitch so that we want to see a Sami Zayn, Bobby Lashley match. But clearly, it was not effective on Raw. Clearly. Because of, of what the skit was. So, you know... I don't mind a bad... I, sometimes these these segments on Raw that are so bad that you're going to just remember them forever are kind of fun to watch because you're like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. You know, you cringe a little bit as it's going. It's crazy. But I think that the cure for this is to hire comedy writers, people who specialize in writing things that make people laugh. You know, I just... Uh, that is how I would handle it. Now, let's go to the number one... Story of the week, and it is absolutely undeniable what the number one story of the week is. This is a story that's so big, I got requests to do a bonus show. Number one, it was a busy week for me, but number two, I just thought it was something that I wanted to save and talk about with you guys here on the podcast uh, on this uh, on, in, in the, on the Thursday drop. And part of that is also because a lot of the details are still in a remains-to-be-seen status. But of course... I'm talking about the fact that uh, in the fall, apparently, SmackDown is moving over to Fox. Lots of rumors that were going on about uh, what was going to go on with the WWE's TV deal. At first, they were saying Fox was going to buy out a portion of the WWE, and Raw was going to move to Fox, uh, Fox Sports 1. Then they said Raw might be on Fox, and SmackDown might be on Fox Sports 1. Then, about a week ago, uh, it came down that Raw, as a matter of fact, it was exactly a week ago at the time of the podcast release because I remember I squeezed it in just in the nick of time to talk about it here on the show. Raw was being kept by USA, but the fees to keep Raw were increasing so much 
that USA was putting SmackDown on the open market. Now, this is a huge news for WWE, a big, big win for them because it, it, it shows you how valuable they are. The USA is like, we just don't, it's just too much. So Fox ends up buying the rights to air SmackDown. And this is not Fox Sports 1, not Fox Sports Net, not FX, not any of these. It's Network Fox. Here in New York, it's Fox 5, whatever the, the network channel is for Fox. There's the Simpsons on Sunday nights, that where you watch your football games for Fox NFL Sunday. That Fox is going to be the Fox that's airing SmackDown. Now, let's talk about the technicalities of it. First of all, there were rumors that it was going to move to three hours. I think that that's very unlikely based on the fact that how networks work. Networks run local news uh, at 10 o'clock. That's why, for instance, when you're watching New Year's, on the weekends, they run local news at 11. When you're watching a New Year's Eve telecast, generally speaking, like a New Year's Rockin' Eve, they take a break from 11 to 11.30. So like from 9 to 11, they're doing a New Year's special. From 11 to 11.30, it's local news. And then at 11.30, it's right back to the New Year's special. And it's a very weird thing that gets done every single year, but it really lets you know that this network news, this local news, is the bread and butter of the affiliate channels that each of these networks air on. So they really don't have, that's why uh, the Tonight Show always started at 11.30 because all the the local channels had to run their nightly news. So the, the Fox network of affiliate channels will not have that 10 o'clock hour available for the most part because over you turn on Fox and what do you see at 10 o'clock? It's the news and it's not getting canceled. So... Um, I would imagine it'll be two hours. I don't I don't think it's likely that they're going to start SmackDown at 7 p.m. Eastern in an effort to get three hours in. You know, I just don't think that that makes any sense. And also, you know, a lot of these networks, you know, make a lot of money airing syndicated shows from 7 to 8 o'clock at night. It's that, it's that two-hour window where a network like Fox airs their original programming. And that's what's going to go on, in my opinion, for SmackDown. Now, the heavy, heavy rumor is that it's going to be on on Friday nights, that SmackDown is moving back to Fridays. And already there are people who are going like, well, you know, Tuesday is a better night for television than Friday is. And that's true. But network, even in 2018, is much, much better than cable. I think that it's crucial that Raw keeps, I mean, that that WWE keeps SmackDown live. I think that they just, and, and it's just a matter of changing the SmackDown Cruise road schedule I think, you know, right now, I think they do Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. No, I think they do Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Yeah. SmackDown right now, that's the schedule. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. They get home on Wednesday. They're there on Thursday. Friday, they they go back out. Maybe it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. No, it's five days. I don't know. But it's just a matter of shifting so that I think SmackDown maybe now gets Tuesdays off and instead is live on Fridays. I think if you tape SmackDown on Tuesday and air it on Friday, it's going to, in 2018, the whole reason why these why Fox is paying so much for SmackDown, this is a five-year deal that is reportedly worth a billion dollars. 52 weeks, you know, in the books for five years, It's a long time for a TV deal. And it is reportedly worth a billion dollars. I was talking to Wade Keller. I'm on his podcast this week. And it works out to something like $4 million per episode of SmackDown. That's the budget. And that budget does leave you with enough money that you can do these shows live. I think you have to do them live. Um, And I yeah, I I would be shocked if WWE does not keep doing them live. Um, and, and I think that, that this is the time they could do away with the brand extension, but I think that this is the time that they actually heighten it. This is the time that maybe Brock Lesnar shows up on SmackDown. Maybe Ronda Rousey shows up on SmackDown just to give Fox their money worth. But I think that you have the opportunity to really separate the brands. Now they're not on the same network. They're not back to back Fox will air commercials for SmackDown, but won't air commercials for Raw. 
USA will air commercials for Raw, but won't air commercials for SmackDown. It will, re- it can potentially really start to feel like two different shows, which was the intention of the draft split to begin with. So I, I, I think that that is also uh, important to me. I think it's crucial that the show stay live, but I think that it's beneficial that the that the roster split remain intact. Um, I think that Fridays are not quite as good as Tuesdays, but if the show stays live and if the show is on a network instead of a cable channel, then you've made up. I mean, then you're still way, 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 way more on the positive side. Plus, the deal is worth a billion dollars. You know, I think that that's good. And personally, you know, I saw a tweet that said, this is not good for wrestling fans because WWE is going to make even more money and then they're going to be able to acquire even more talent and they're going to strip the indies and they're going to strip the non-WWE organizations of talent and they're all going to be in WWE and it's going to kill the wrestling industry. And blah, blah. And it's like, you're really reaching, dude. Come on. Come on. When you're looking at a deal like this that makes WWE seem like they're awesome because the network wants them so bad and it turns professional wrestling, sports entertainment, WWE, into a TV show that's worth a billion dollars, that's good for everything surrounding pro wrestling. Everything. Whether you're a fan, whether you're a superstar, whatever you are, whether you're in WWE or outside of WWE, this whole deal is a complete windfall for wrestling in general. As a fan of wrestling, there is no reason to be even remotely pessimistic about this deal, in my opinion. I think it's amazing. And... Look, think about how great SmackDown is. Now, it's really interesting when you look at it. Apparently, SmackDown's ratings were as low as they've ever been this week, which I can't necessarily explain. I think that SmackDown is missing a little bit of something to really sink your teeth into, but it's a better show than Raw. You know, it was this week anyway. I, You know, ending... Here's the thing. Ending with Daniel Bryan versus Jeff Hardy is a dream match. I still think Daniel Bryan needs a real storyline. He doesn't have a real storyline, and I think he needs one. That said, as a fan, I can't believe we are main eventing SmackDown next week with Samoa Joe versus Daniel Bryan. I simply can't wait. I can't believe it. After seeing these guys wrestle in Ring of Honor, after seeing them go their separate ways in Samoa Joe, going to uh, Impact and all this stuff, I don't think any of us ever expected... Daniel Bryan versus Samoa Joe inside a WWE ring. But next week on SmackDown, I think it's going to be really, really special. And I hope that people watch it. You know, I hope that now that they've announced this already, that this is happening on SmackDown, that it becomes must-see television. All that said, I think that when SmackDown becomes even more separated, maybe you're still in a bit of a raw hangover. You just watched three hours of wrestling last night. Your wife doesn't want to let you watch wrestling again. Okay, it happens. Maybe when SmackDown is separated by four days, it'll be a little bit easier for people to swallow watching another two hours. I don't know. It remains to be seen, but I am excited to see where this thing goes. It is an exciting time to be a wrestling fan, and uh, I think this whole thing is just really, really cool. Speaking of really, really cool, you are really, really cool for staying, uh, listening to this entire podcast. Uh, you can get all the shows over at NotSam.com. The YouTube channel is YouTube.com slash NotSam. I appreciate all you guys being a part of Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast, and we will see you next week right here. Thanks again to Mauro Ronaldo for being a part of Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Follow at NotSam on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And subscribe for free to listen every week to Sam Roberts Wrestling Podcast.